Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Olivia, and I am the Human Nature Series Coordinator at Shavers Creek. The Human Nature Series is a series of public workshops that explores the health benefits associated with spending time in natural spaces and encourages participants to connect with the earth. It is human nature after all. This season, we have partnered with Webster's Bookstore and Cafe, Clearwater Conservancy, and Purple Wizard Maps to bring you virtual workshops that help bridge the gap between our health and the natural world. Today, we are joined by Richard Louvre. Richard Louvre is a journalist and author of 10 books, including Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder, The Nature Principle, and Vitamin N. His new book, Our Wild Calling, How Connecting with Animals Can Transform Our Lives and Save Theirs, translated into languages, translated into 22 languages, his book has helped launch an international movement to connect children, their families, and communities to nature. He is the co-founder and chair emeritus of the nonprofit Children in Nature Network, which supports a new nature movement. Today, we are going to dive into his new book, Our Wild Calling, to explore how connecting with animals positively impacts our health and what we should be doing to support and protect the non-human animals that we share our planet with. As Richard is presenting, please put any questions that you have regarding the topic or any of his previous work in the chat box on your screen. We will try to get to as many questions as we can after his presentation. Okay, enough from me. Let's get started. Hello, Richard. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Olivia. Thanks for inviting me. Um, where do you want to start? Well, we can start. Uh, do you just want to dive into our wild calling and talk a little bit about that work? Okay, sure. Well, first, the, the context of our wild calling is it's the fourth. Uh, I've written 10 books, but our wild calling is the fourth that is specifically about the relationship between humans and, and nature. And the other ones were Last Child in the Woods and then The Nature Principle, uh, which both of those were about nature deficit disorder, as I called it. Uh, nature Principle is more about adults and what kind of society we could have if our lives were as, as immersed in uh, nature as they are in technology. Um, the third book was Vitamin N, which is uh, a how-to book. It's 500 things that communities and families and places of worship and all kinds of organizations can do to connect families to nature, cities as well. And then this book is um, Our Wild Calling. It's specifically about the relationship between humans and our fellow animals. And um, it is both about domesticated animals and wild animals. There's more wild animals in the book. Uh, but I wanted to uh, uh, focus in on, on that, partly because I, I realized that um, when you look at the research that has just grown exponentially in the last few years about the benefits of nature for human health and well-being, mental health, physical health, cognitive functioning, uh, creativity, all of that, that has uh, increased uh, in incredibly. And I should say that when I wrote Last Child, which was published in 2005, I could find about 60 studies that, that I felt good about uh, citing in the book. Uh, and that was incredibly small number. And this, this issue of how the experiences in the natural world affect our, 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 our health and well-being was very neglected by the academic world. And in fact, neglected by uh, society itself, except for indigenous uh, cultures that have kept that alive for a long time. Uh, and, and a few pioneers in the, in the research. Uh, how something like that had, could have gone so unnoticed for so long, I think is partly because science has a hard time defining nature, and we can talk about that later if you want. Uh, the, the other reason is where does research money come from? You know, what can you sell? Today, there's now over a thousand studies that the Children in Nature Network has on a free library. You can go to childreninnature.org 
And there are over a thousand abstracts that were independently done from the Children Nature Network, which is the nonprofit that grew out of Last Child. Uh, they were done first by some folks at uh, Yale and now some folks uh, out of University of Minnesota. Very, very independent. We don't, we don't control that copy. So we're very fastidious about being conservative, about making uh, too many claims about the research. But thousand studies now, most of them are about the benefits, and they pretty much all point in the same direction, which is this is fundamental uh, to human health and well-being and really to being alive, which I think is the umbrella idea here. Feeling, being fully alive, health is a subset of that. Um, when you look at those studies though, there's, there's very few about the human relationship with other animals. There are studies of domestic animals and how they affect us and how dogs, for instance, somebody who owns a dog is more likely to live longer. Um, we're not sure whether that's correlation or cause, but there's some evidence that it's causal. You take your dog for walks, you go for a walk. There, there's, uh, you know, when you pet your cat, uh, it tends to uh, calm you down, maybe lower your blood pressure for some people as it does for some people. Uh, but when you look at wild animals, there's very little. Uh, you know, how does that coyote that goes through your backyard that stops and stares at you, how does that affect you? Um, you know, how does it, how does it uh, affect you when you live in what my older son once called a neighborhood of animals? We recently, well, two years ago, we moved to Julian, California, which is up in the mountains east of San Diego. And we're surrounded by critters. And my older son was home with us uh, for a while. And he looked out the window and saw the, you know, all the, uh, the ground squirrels, the California ground squirrels, which I always thought were kind of boring until I started learning about them. And, uh, you know, ground squirrels, for instance, uh, they have a kind of language where they warn each other. They cooperate with birds in terms of warning calls. Uh, they also, if a snake approaches, uh, their nemesis is the rattlesnakes, of course. And so when a snake approaches, one of them will get up on a rock and he'll blow up his tail or her tail and wave it. It's called flagging. And all the other uh, squirrels see that and they, they hide. And the other thing they do is uh, when they see a rattlesnake skin that's been shed on the ground, uh, the mother or father squirrel will go and they'll roll in it and they'll get the scent of that rattlesnake on themselves. Then they'll go home to their, their babies and roll with their babies and get their babies scented like that. Confuses the snake. And so, you know, when you, when you really start to watch these animals and listen to them and pay attention to them, and then that forces you to Google them because you get interested in them or pull the book down off the, uh, off the shelf and you really start to, to learn them. So what happens to people when they begin to be really aware of the, the neighborhood of animals, which I think is part of a larger family in which we, with which we live. Um, one of the main topics of, of uh, the book is human loneliness. And obviously this was, this was published in November and it was, you know, I was out on the book tour and that, that's when the, uh, the epidemic began or the pandemic. And so this issue of human isolation is really on our minds right now. But that was a central theme of our wild calling. Uh, medical folks have been saying for quite a while that, uh, um, Human isolation, loneliness is or has already, is about to or has surpassed obesity and smoking as a cause of early mortality, early death. It's associated with many of the same diseases as obesity and smoking are associated. Uh, this is really only now being recognized as being important to our health and our children's health. This has been uh, growing more evident as people long before the pandemic started moving indoors, 
having what I'd called nature deficit disorder before, spending a lot of time online, um, as we all do, as we're doing right now. Um, so this, this sense of isolation, it's not only because of electronics, it's because of the design of cities. People get preached to all the time, take a walk. In some neighborhoods, walk where? You know, maybe you're lucky and there's a Starbucks within walking, or maybe there's not even a grocery store in some neighborhoods to walk to, let alone natural settings. And the, the, the uh, parks and uh, connection to nature in cities is, is very, very inequitable. Some cities, uh, uh, I think Pittsburgh and Philadelphia are better than some other cities in terms of that because Frederick Law Homestead came through early on and you have some great parks in Pennsylvania, urban parks. Not so true in the Sun Belt. Um, uh, but the effect of this human loneliness is, is really staggering. I make the case in our wild calling that that loneliness, that human loneliness that so many people feel now and is really affecting our health is actually rooted in an even deeper loneliness, which is species loneliness. Um, the, the, the urban parks that have the highest benefit for human psychological health just happen to be the ones that have the highest biodiversity. I don't think that's an accident. Um, I think that as a species, we are desperate to not feel alone in the universe. Why else would we look for Bigfoot? And I spent a lot of time with Bigfoot hunters. Uh, I wrote a long piece years ago about them. And they're great, I, I love being with them. Um, but they express this indirectly through their stories that they're really out there looking for some kind of connection that is hard for them to describe. Some of them just want to kill Bigfoot and drag it home, but others, there's a mystery going on there inside themselves, I think, that they don't fully understand and neither do I. Why else would we look for intelligent life on other planets? You know, when we're warned by uh, some people that that may, might not be a good idea to find I think it's because we are desperate not to feel alone in the universe. Now the irony is, and this has some religious implications obviously in terms of not being alone, uh, but in the physical world, we are not alone. Uh, We're surrounded by a greater family of animals and plants. And they're always talking out there. They're talking with us when we don't notice it. They're talking with each other. They're talking, they're communicating across species barriers. Uh, I mentioned the squirrels and the birds that have some shared language in terms of warning signs, uh, sounds and, and all of that. And if we stop and begin to pay attention, suddenly we're surrounded not only by uh, you know, a sense of fascination that permeates everything. It's a, I describe it in the book as a kind of whisper. It's always there. Uh, but we don't feel so alone in the universe. And I think that this isn't the answer to human loneliness, but it's part of the answer. It's part of our loneliness, deep loneliness as a species. Um, when I was, the, the first story I tell in the book, and the book is organized around a lot of stories that people sent me or I interviewed people, uh, uh, and it turns out that everybody has a story they want to tell me about an animal that changed their life, that somehow was transformative, somehow in the very moment that it happened, even if it was only a few seconds with a wild animal, or if it was a relationship over time with a dog or a cat. Um, oftentimes people are embarrassed to tell these stories. Some of the stories that people uh, told me in, in the book is the first time they told anybody because they were worried to be accused of some kind of AG and stuff which Outside Magazine, by the way, did a uh, profile of me on the book. And they, 
they, it was a great profile, but they said I was starting to sound a little new agey. And I thought that was pretty funny because anybody who knows me knows I'm kind of the last person. But I will fess up to that. I, I think I am now starting to sound that way. And it's because of this book. It's because of these stories that, that people have told me. Um, the first story is in the introduction. It's a story of my own when I was in uh, on Kodiak Island in Alaska. And my son was there. He's my guide there. And I was on my way from the cabin to the lodge. And I was looking through my wallet, which I shouldn't have been doing because there's Alaskan brown bears that come through the cabins all the time through. And uh, you don't want to surprise them and you don't want to be surprised by them. But I was looking at my wallet because my son was my guide and I was trying to figure out what's appropriate to <laughs> a tip for your son. And uh, uh, all of a sudden I stopped in my tracks or was stopped in my tracks by these two eyes that were looking right at me piercing eyes. I was lucky, it was not a bear. It was a really large black fox. The foxes on Kodiak Island are among the largest in the world. They may be the largest in the world. They're basically the size of a, of a good sized coyote, some of these foxes. Um, and it was just staring at me. It was blocking my path. I couldn't get past it. And uh, when I looked into those eyes, I suddenly realized that, um, that at least the way I was interpreting what I saw, it was like I was looking into another universe. It was like two feet from me. And um, I wasn't sure what was in that universe. Uh, I don't presume uh, to know what that animal was thinking. Uh, and this is a tricky thing because, it, and we'll talk about that later, it, we have to be careful about anthropomorphism, but I actually think that some types of anthropomorphism are highly underrated, that this is something that some of the cutting edge biologists and scientists, wildlife biologists, are starting to recognize. This deep empathy we feel with other animals, we sometimes mistake for the worst kind of anthropomorphism when actually it is something that we need to reclaim and rediscover. So the fox was looking at me and finally, uh, I took a step and I, I was thinking, is, does it, is it sick? Is it rabid? Does it want me to feed it? I checked with the lodge later, nobody was feeding that fox. And I stepped forward, it stepped aside. I kept walking and I said to the fox, why don't you come with me? I'm going up to the lodge, you wanna go, go with me? <laughs> and it trotted along next to me all the way up the path and then right before we got to the lodge, it veered off into the high grass and disappeared. And I, and, and I end the introduction by saying, you know, I don't presume to know what the, the fox was thinking or was it saying something to me? And, uh, and I concluded that maybe, remember I'd been walking along looking at my wallet. Maybe the fox was just telling me to pay attention. And in an odd way, that became, that's the theme of the book that I didn't realize until a Canadian radio interviewer was asking me, well, what does it all come down to, Mr. Lou, this book? Uh, what is the main lesson? And I think that's it, what the fox, I felt the fox was saying in some way or might've been saying, which is pay attention. And um, there's a oceanographer at, at um, uh, uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He's, he's a famous, among oceanographers, he's one of the most well-known. His name is Paul Dayton, and I've become friends with him over, over the years. He's a great guy. I, th I think he's close to 80 now, and he's still out there. Uh, and he told me a story about when he was a student at the University of Washington, and he was out in the Pacific Ocean, on the bottom of the ocean, with, a, with scuba gear and he was collecting samples and lunch, by the way, he's a student, he was looking for lunch, but he was studying starfish. So he was looking for uh, these uh, samples and uh, face down and suddenly he felt something really large. He intuited something really large was coming above him and then stopping really large. 
that's usually not indicative of a good thing. And um, so he slowly looked up and he saw a big tentacle coming down. And then he looked over here and he saw another big tentacle coming down. And so Paul says, um, at the risk of anthropomorphism, he looked up and he saw that it was one of the really big Pacific octopus, uh, uh, octopuses that have like a 12 foot wingspan in their, in their tentacles. And it was looking down at him. And Paul said, it decided I was a clam and it came down and got me. And it got him, it wrapped him up in its tentacles, this huge octopus. He says, people think those tentacles are soft. They're not soft, anything but. You can't budge them. And not only that, but these tentacles are pretty strange. Each, of, each arm of, a, of an octopus has what amounts to a kind of independent brain in that arm. Not only that, but the skin has a really unusual number of photons in the skin, which are the cells that we use, that anim animals use to see. I'm not quite sure what they use those cells for. I'm not saying that the that the octopus was seeing Paul with its arms, but it was surely getting to know him really well. And about that time, he realized he was running out of oxygen. And uh, he, with the last of his strength, he pushed off the bottom with his feet, and he and the octopus started going up through a column of water toward the surface. As they went up, the octopus moved around his body. He could feel the razor sharp beak going around. I love telling this story because I love seeing audiences squirm. So it was coming around his neck until he was looking into the eye of the octopus. And he was stunned. That eye contact, contact stunned him. And he said, I think we, the octopus and I made our non-aggression pact. And the minute he felt that, the octopus loosened its grip and moved back for him a little bit. And then they, then they both hit the surface at the same time. The octopus goes be below the surface just a little bit. Paul rips off his mask. He's looking down into the water. He's looking at the octopus. He's still making eye contact with him. And uh, the, the next part is the best part of the story. What does Paul do? He puts the mask back on. And as he watches the octopus start to disappear down into the darkness, he chases it back down. I said, Paul, that's nuts. Why would you do such a thing? And he, he said he didn't know. And in fact, he added a later detail. He didn't tell me. It's not in the book when I talked to him again. He said he caught up with the octopus. And as they went down, they spiraled with each other, going around looking at each other. And I said, why, Paul? And he says he doesn't understand. He's a hardcore, strict scientific method kind of guy. He's a scientist. He said he doesn't know, but he knows it somehow felt spiritual. And whatever happened in those moments, he did not want the moments to end. That theme comes up again and again in the stories in the book, no matter what kind of animal someone has an encounter with. Um, sometimes it's a, a domestic animal, sometimes it's a wild animal. They don't want those moments to end when they make that kind of connection. And something happens in those moments that is very hard for people to describe. But this is a common experience. They have kind of altered states too. Sometimes time disappears or bends. Um, sometimes a sense of scale shifts radically. Um, uh, a couple other quick stories to illustrate this. One is about a, a dog. Uh, a, a woman named Lisa Donahue in Toronto uh, we were talking about something else one day, and she happened to bring this up. She didn't, I wasn't writing a book about animals at that point, but she said that um, had a young son, six years old, and a dog named Jack, a really big dog. And so Lisa walked into the living room one day, and her six-year-old son was stretched out on the carpet, 
behind Jack and Jack was stretched out on the carpet, this big dog. And he's, her son's got his hand around Jack. And she hears her son say, I don't have a heart anymore. And Lisa said, what are you saying? And her son said, my heart is in Jack. See, that permeability, we felt that. We felt that with other people. We also feel that with animals. And maybe we don't recognize it sometimes when, we, when it happens, but some people do. And the more you think about that, the more you hear these stories, the more you realize you've had that experience. Um, that permeability. What is that? The last story is another one of mine. I was on a lake near San Diego one early morning. I have a little electric motor on my boat. And I saw on the, the shore uh, what I thought were uh, two vultures eating a dead fish. And I eased up my boat toward them. And uh, they were not uh, vultures. There were two giant golden eagles, really large golden eagles. I got within about 20 feet of them and stayed there. You don't get within 20 feet of golden eagles most, most of the time. And so for what seemed like forever, again, this sense of this altered state of time disappearing or bending, you know, which Paul, by the way, also described, um, it seemed like forever. And the, the, the eagles would lean down, take a bite of the fish, and then look up at me. And they'd go down, take another bite, look up at me. This went on over and over again. And there's something about that. Something shifted in me, between us. I don't, you know, something changed. I went home. My son was home uh, from college. My younger son was home from college. And I told him about this. And I said, you know, it's really hard to explain. But Matthew, whoever I say I am, I'm not. Whoever I really am is who I was in those moments with the eagles. It's really primal. It's really, uh, and I said to him, I don't have the words to explain this. This is beyond human language. Later, I heard this again and again and again from people with their encounters with, with animals, even if it was just a few seconds. I, the, the point of the book is a search, it, you know, it goes a lot of places. It looks at a lot of trends that are happening between humans and other animals, the future of cities. It looks at how we're, uh, people are, um, biologists are now moving whole species across state lines because of climate change. It's the effect of, of um, the climate emergency on our relationship with other animals. But fundamentally, it comes down to this question, what is that? What is that thing between us that happens when we're paying attention with us and other, other creatures? Um, Martin Buber, the, the great intellectual, and I always have to be careful not to say Justin Bieber. Um, Martin Buber uh, wrote a wonderful essay. It was, the name of it was I and Thou. And, uh, it was about this thing between people. And basically what he said, Olivia, is that you and I don't exist. Not really. We don't exist without this thing between us, which is relationship. Even if it's just a few minutes or a few seconds. Um, he thought, Martin Buber thought of that thing between us as a kind of electricity that some people call God. Um, as I listened to these stories again and again, I thought, you know, that's kind of what it is. Uh, we crave that relationship. This is deep within us. Uh, and part of our loneliness as a species is that we don't pay attention to that. And when we do, the whole world comes alive. Um, in any case, uh, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but are we okay on time? Do I need to keep going or go to the discussion? 
We're all okay on time if you want to keep going, or we can start with the discussion if you'd like. Why don't we start with a discussion then? Why don't we do that? Great. Yeah, so just a couple of things that occurred to me while you were speaking. I mean, this is all really great information and things that we don't really think of on a daily basis, but make so much sense when they're said out loud. Um, but the one thing that I that first occurred to me is it seems that you have all of these wonderful experiences with animals, but then you also recognize the lack of research between um, our health benefits and wildlife. So was there any specific instance that um, inspired this book? Was it one of those interactions? Was it the lack of research that you saw while you were writing your other books? Or what exactly made you want to write this book? Well, I think the recognition of the lack of research came later. It was really that fox that stopped me on Kodiak. And, you know, it stunned me. And, I, and it's not as if I hadn't thought of that before, that what is going on there. I, I realized that I used to feel this a lot when I was a kid. Uh, kids feel this naturally. Uh, um, so really it was that. But then the more stories I heard, I kept wondering, what is that? The research, I think, is a side question. It's a very important question. And we have to remember, it's not, you know, I'm very uh, careful not to say that this is all about us. It's not just about our health or our well-being or what we get out of the relationship uh, with uh, the other animal. In fact, near the end of the book, I, I, I talk about, or I elaborate on a th another theme in the book, which is that habit, I, by the way, that, that thing between us and other animals, it, it had no name and I decided in my, in my presumption to name it. And I call that the habitat of the heart. And I think there are two habitats. There's the physical habitat that we spend a lot of time working to try to preserve and protect as we should. And then there's this other habitat, the habitat of the heart, uh, which we spend very little time um, talking about, trying to nurture in our kids, in ourselves, in others. Um, and the deal is that if one of those habitats goes, so does the other one. I think this is fundamental to the future of environmentalism, to the future of environmental education, to the future of conservation, uh, to the future uh, of our species, is to recognize that other habitat, the habitat of the heart. Um, the, uh, something I wanna make sure I say in case we run out of time. Right now, we're in a situation where we have kind of the four horsemen of the apocalypse out there right now. One is the climate emergency. The other is biodiversity collapse. Uh, another one is the threat of not only the reality, but the threat of future pandemics that are, then that's very linked to how we treat other animals. Um, and the fourth is human isolation in the universe our sense of loneliness, species loneliness. I think those are the four interrelated horsemen of the apocalypse right now. And then we're confronting all four of them at the same time. We talk about the pandemic, but all four of those are happening. All are related. Uh, they also share some common solutions, which we'll talk about later, I think, in terms of the One Health movement that treats the health of uh, other species and our species and the health of the earth itself as one health. It's a new approach to public health. Um, but what I wanted to say is that why is it on all four of those areas, climate emergency, biodiversity collapse, uh, pandemics, human loneliness, we've got the science. We know the data. We've known it for a long time. Why doesn't the data move people more to action? Uh, and I, I think that has something to do with the habitat of the heart. Uh, Glenn Albrecht, who's a great eco-philosopher in Australia, 
that I quote in the book and have gotten to know. He wrote a recent uh, piece, a blog of his, where he asked that question that I've asked for a while, which is, why aren't we moved more by the data? We already knew about the pandemics. We already knew what is coming with climate change, and yet we move so slowly to action. And he pointed out that the great social movements, uh, whether it's uh, civil rights to an extent or gay rights or um, uh, feminism, the great social movements have not been moved by data alone. Data is important. They've all been based on relationship, on love, as he puts it. And what's missing right now in our discussion about climate change and about these other biodiversity collapse, all these other major the pandemic threat, our own isolation. I think we're too reliant on the data. We always need more science, but we need to somehow, and I don't have a magic bullet, but we need to somehow broaden that conversation on all of those fronts, which are actually the same front to include love, to include our deep relationship in the habitat of the heart with all other species, with the earth itself. Somehow that's got to come to the front of the conversation. Otherwise the conversation is going to, maybe it'll break loose now because of the pandemic, but we're still gonna need that added element long answer to a question I veered off into the weeds like that fox did. <laughs> That's certainly okay. Um, yeah, I see that. Uh, I was telling you a little earlier, Richard, but uh, at Chevers Creek, I uh, am mainly an environmental educator for our young people. Um, so when they come out for field trips, we start them out on the trails. So some days we see kids that don't really care about nature, don't really spend time out in nature. But then at the end of the day, after they've kind of discovered that habitat of the heart that you talked about, you see them wanting to fight for these things that they've just seen or want to stand up for them. So I think that bringing love into it is definitely a solution in some, I mean, it's like you said, kind of easy with kids, it becomes naturally to them, but we definitely need to find a way to incorporate that back into our daily lives. And I, I, I should add that one of the things that has prevented us from doing that is the taboo on anthropomorphism, on projecting human qualities onto animals to the extent that we forget, a, we demean their, like with a dog, we demean its dogness or uh, a fox, we demean its foxness uh, if we uh, project too much of ourselves onto it. On the other hand, um, that taboo has become so strict that Paul Dayton, for instance, who tells the story of the octopus, told me that if he told that story at a conference of oceanographers at least a few years ago, uh, he would have been shunned uh, because it, you know, it's it was too new agey. It was too uh, uh, anthropomorphic. Uh, there's a guy. Uh, uh, who is a, a psychologist, a human nature psychologist, and um, or humans and animal psychologist, and uh, um, a herpetologist. I'm blanking on his right name, right? Bergdorf is his last name. Uh, Rob, Bob Bergdorf, I believe. Um, and he talks about what he calls uh, 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 applied anthropomorphism. I'll get it right here, critical anthropomorphism. And he, what he describes that as is, he says, if you're gonna study a snake, you have to sit with the snake, you have to be with the snake, you have to watch the snake. And he said, this is two stages, he says, of critical anthropomorphism, one is, you conjure up all the science, the hard science that you know about that snake. What is it doing with its tongue? What happened to land on and see in the world in its own way? Um, and the second step 
is use your imagination. What's it like to sense the world for a snake? Um, and yes, that sounds like anthropomorphism, but it's actually empathy. When combined with knowledge of hard science, he says, if you do those two things, both apply the hard science in your mind and then use your imagination to be that snake, he said only then, he feels, can you really ask the best scientific questions about the snake. Uh, I think that should be taught in schools. I think environmental educators could use that at nature centers and, and all of that. Uh, it, it is an exercise that really brings us closer to that habitat of the heart. One of the reasons I think it should be taught in high schools, in, in schools, particularly middle school, I think, is that many kids um, just really resonate to other animals. I, I know as a kid, I, I knew the, the names of, I had a golden book of reptiles in my back pocket all the time. I knew the name, I, all the neighbors that wanted a snake out of their yard, they always called me. So I knew everything about snakes. And uh, as I got older, and I, and I knew a lot about other animals too, grew up a lot in the woods. Um, by the time I came to middle school, I'd been really good at science, really good at, at biology and all that up until middle school. And then they turned it into math, the biology teachers. They turned it into numbers, into data. And I know there's a real reason for doing that, and that's a good thing. But they kind of took the life out of it. It's pretty hard to take the life out of biology, but they manage. There are studies of, of indigenous people who show that in the United States, who show that up until uh, uh, middle school, they're the best uh, when compared to um, uh, many kids in, of other ethnic backgrounds or, or cultural backgrounds. They really understand or really into it, into biology, into the science. And then something happens, the same thing happens to me. It turns into math and life goes out of it. The stories disappear. It's one of the reasons why this book is so focused on stories. We have to tell each other these stories. We have lots of them to tell. And these stories have meaning. And the more we tell them, I've learned from, you know, when I go around the country now, everybody, just like everybody had a story to tell me about their experience with nature when they were a kid or about their own children's and their experience. Now people want to tell me about their animal stories, those moments when they entered the habitat of the heart. Uh, we, this is deep within us, the need to tell these stories. Uh, long ago, our ancestors came back from the forest around the fire and they told stories of animals. Sometimes they, be, they, they acted out the animals. Sometimes they danced to become the bear. This is deep within us, we need this. This is one of the ways that human beings find uh, meaning in the, in the universe. Yeah, actually to go along with that, we just got a question in from a guest watching. Uh, they just said, how can people share love through storytelling, sharing experiences of nature and animals while actually exciting listening? I, th I think it's, you know, what I've witnessed again and again is that when they finally do start telling these stories, you know, the room fills with love. Now, sometimes fear is involved. You know, I'm not saying that all of these stories have a happy ending. Uh, but that fear is very related to awe. The studies of, of awe that we feel, which is very important for our mental health, for our uh, sense of being alive, um, those have characteristics, uh, experiences that create awe in us, typically take us out of our comfort zone and sometimes involve fear. Uh, so quite a few of the stories in the book involve animals that could, you know, consume us. Uh, and there's great meaning to be found in those stories. Uh, when we feel that sense of awe, I think we're more open also to feeling love. Uh, 
you know, think for anyone who's been in the delivery room, think about that combination of fear and awe and then love that you feel when something new comes into the earth, something living. Um, that's something like what we feel when we're truly engaged with other animals. And then when we tell stories about that, those stories gather meaning and give us more meaning the more we tell them. Uh, I, I would like, one of the things I hope from this book is that when people read it, is that they'll start, um, you know, having dinner with their family and start saying, okay, now we're gonna tell some animal stories. Who had an experience today? Or tell me what, dad, what, what about that wolf you saw when you were a kid? Or what about that turtle you had that had a name? It was Theodore, right? Tell me about the turtle, dad. You know, um, another idea that I have in the book, and this has to do with uh, uh, one of the uh, sections of the book is called the betweens, and animals, wild animals are moving into cities. We're having more and more dogs, for instance. The, the city planner of Toronto told me there were, several years ago, there were already more dogs than children in, in Toronto. You also have wild animals, some of them predators, some of them, you know, were, were uh, in San Diego, you've had uh, mountain lions coming in. You have bears coming to the edge now. You've already had raccoons for a long time. Um, crows, uh, these are, these are um, um, uh, uh, there's, there's a name for this kind of animal. I'll think about it in a, <laughs> remember in a minute. As they come in, uh, we're going to have a choice. And this is particularly true now that Sooner or later, there may be a backlash toward wild animals in human settlements because of the connection of bats and other animals to zoonotic diseases. The transference of, of infectious diseases from other animals to people and vice versa. Uh, we have a choice as these animals come into our cities. Um, we can exterminate them all. That's been the human inclination, at least among some cultures, for quite a while. Or we can know them better. We can get to uh, know them. And one of the suggestions I make is that why not create neighborhood wildlife watch groups? It's kind of like neighborhood watch, but the neighborhood would get to, you can do this on Facebook too. You don't have to get into one room. And uh, where the neighborhood, uh, not only the kids, but the parents, the, the retirees at the corner, agree to watch the animals and to trade notes on what they see, tell each other stories about what they saw in their neighborhood. Tell them about the coyote that came through. Tell them about the raccoons, the, the baby raccoons underneath the porch. And the birds they see, even in the most densely populated urban neighborhood, there are birds, there are raptors on the, the um, window ledge on the building across. To notice those, to pay attention to those, to use your senses, listen to their language, learn their language. People are starting to teach bird language, by the way, which is a whole other chapter of the book. Um, and agree to do two things. One is, in addition to knowing those animals and learning about them and telling stories, and noticing when they come through, notice the new animals that are arriving with climate change and the others that are disappearing. To agree to, to the extent that you can, as a neighborhood, protect those wild animals. The other thing to do is to protect people. Uh, to know what to do when you see a coyote that looks sick and who to call to report that animal that is acting strangely or is getting too, too aggressive because some of your neighbors insisted on feeding the wild animals and to educate your neighbors not to do that and to get your neighbors excited about this neighborhood of animals, about the larger family in which we live. I'd love to see those all over the country, just like family nature clubs have started up. Uh, uh, I think in the, in the doing of that, we not only connect with other animals, but we connect each other, which is part of, I think, the lesson of this book, which is um, this is about human social capital as well as our connection to animals. 
the people, there's a guy named John Young who teaches, takes hundreds of people out into the forest to learn bird language. He's very good at it. And people are really getting into this. And it's not so much how to talk to the birds as to understand what they're saying around you. It's fascinating when you, when you start to, to learn this. And he says that people, after they learn this, they go home and they come back and they report to him, John, I'm getting along with my wife better or I'm getting along with my husband better. And I don't, since I took this, this course in bird language, how can that be? It seems to be connected. He says, you know, it's probably because you're actually listening to them. <laughs> so this, this thing about paying attention to the animals around us transfers to a social capital, maybe organizing that to a degree to these um, uh, um, neighborhood animal watch groups could be a way to, to bond us to other people, to bring us again even more out of our sense of loneliness as a species. Yes, definitely. As we're um, connecting with our neighbors and the animals in our community, I can definitely see how that love can grow. And as that love and empathy grows for animals, I can also see that making um, different changes to our lifestyle, which ties into another question that we have from an audience member that says, how does our diet affect relationships to animals? So diet or different lifestyle choices that we're making, how does that tie in with our relationship to those animals. I think there's a, uh, I won't say that I'm a vegan yet, but getting closer to that and I'm not pure. So I'm not vegan yet. And uh, that's not a put down. That's an actual, I'm, I'm actually saying, I, I'm starting to think that way a lot more. And uh, my wife and I actually don't eat very much meat at all and seems to be less these days. Um, factory farms uh, and how we treat other animals. And that has something to do, with, by the way, with the coronavirus, with future viruses that can emerge, zoonotic diseases that emerge when animals are, are held in too uh, tight a quarter in which people come in and out. And it's not only cruel, but it's a good way to plant new pandemics. Um, uh, I think that the, the biodiversity is often a, can be an antidote to um, the spread of disease, zoonotic disease, even in cities. And I actually believe that uh, cities can become engines of biodiversity, not just the enemy. And we can talk about that later. Um, but in terms of your personal decisions, um, it, it does become very personal. I'm careful in the book though, not to, not, not to be um, uh, too strict in that definition. Uh, I want lots of people at the table talking about this. You know, I want hunters at the table talking about this and farmers and ranchers and not only, you know, uh, one portion of the society that's made decisions about eating, but we all need to face those questions, but we all need to talk about our relationship with other animals. Yes, I definitely agree. I think that um, bringing all those people in and bringing all those viewpoints is very critical to that conversation. Uh, but you also mentioned about making it personal. And another question that we had was, uh, what kind of research is is there, if any, on genetic or cultural factors that may impact the deep connection with nature? Are there patterns amongst those who portray biophilia? Uh, pattern among who, what? The, any that, um, that connect with biophilia. Yeah, and biophilia is, um, the, the definition is love of life, and E.O. Wilson uh, picked that up several decades ago and talks about the biophilia hypothesis, which is that as a species, we have an affiliation with the rest of nature. We need contact with the rest of nature, otherwise we don't do so well. And uh, that's been the basis of a lot of research that's been done that uh, uh, says that this, this is fundamental to our health to have that connection. Um, and it's also fundamental uh, to cognition, to 
ability to learn and create, uh, which is one of the reasons why nature preschools have caught on in, the, in recent years and all mm -hmm. that. In terms of um, um, cultural aspects, uh, uh, obviously indigenous people have been closer to this, some of them, many of them, not all of them, have been closer to thinking like this than the majority society, or at least they have more, they being some of them, have more uh, historical background in that than people who look for me, like me, who come from a more European background. Mm -hmm. But all of us were originally indigenous. And uh, uh, in the book, I have a, a chapter near the end about schools and about animals in schools or animals um, appreciating animals or using animals and nature as a learning environment. And um, there's a, a great, um, learning tool. It's a book, but it's more than that. Um, it comes out of Canada, and I think it's called Natural Learning. You know, I, I quote it in the book and, and praise it in the book. And it was done in cooperation with several First Nations uh, groups in Canada, in which how do you, how do you uh, inculcate uh, environmental learning or education in general with some of these Indigenous uh, values and indigenous stories and indigenous learning. Um, uh, you know, I, I just think there's great um, potential for more of that to come into the society. It's time for that. It's time mm -hmm. for more of that to be in our schools and in our lives. Yeah, so as we're bringing uh, animals into schools with teaching or um, into our lives with things such as pets or domestic animals, uh, someone just asked, can you discuss the nuances in people's relations to captive versus wild animals? Yeah, um, there is a, a chapter called reptiles and, reptiles and Ambivalence <laughs> in the book. I went to a reptile show in San Diego and that's the exotic pet industry. And uh, I interviewed a lot of people there. And um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a chapter that's filled with ambivalence. Because on one hand, I really appreciated how some of those people there really loved animals, really loved reptiles and knew lots about them. And there's a whole thing about how these are bred and uh, some are from the wild and they shouldn't be and all of that. It's, it's, it's filled with troubling nuances. At the same time, they, many of them had this feeling about the animals that they kept. And how many of us as, as kids did that and had a sense of love for that? snake we brought home from the road and kept in the aquarium for a while or in the terrarium. And if we were smart, maybe we'd let it go later, took it back to where it was belong. I did that a lot when I was a kid. Um, uh, but the, these moments in terms of captivity are two things. One is, and this is a personal thing, is that they're not clean, they're not um, clear. When I was a kid, I really wanted a pet uh, raccoon. My parents were pretty smart. They knew already that raccoons are real cute when they're babies and then when they get adults, they're not so cute. They're, you gotta be careful. And um, they still look cute, but they don't not treat you in that way. Um, so they were smart, they said, no, no, no raccoon. So they let me, this is in the day, in the 50s, where you could mail order animals from the back of Boy's Life magazine. And I ordered an indigo snake from, I think it was either Florida or Louisiana. Today, I'd probably be put in jail if I did that, but then it was just done. So the indigo snake arrives by post office, by, by the postman brings the box. <laughs> of the indigo snake and the indigo snake was in there and I took it out and it was a huge snake. It was five, six feet long and a beautiful snake. They're, they're very, very endangered now. Gorgeous, it's a constrictor. 
And I had that for a while as a, I think I was eight or nine. And I'd walk through my, my mother's bridge parties with a snake around my neck and <laughs> get, the, get the reaction I wanted and um, took naps with the snake. It was a wonderful snake. It never tried to bite me. But then because it had been in this package, this awful package, it had rubbed its nose raw on the chicken wire on the inside. It was very cruel. I was shit. It got an infection. It turned into what, at least then, I've looked this up, I'm not sure what it's called now. It was called canker mouth and it would get this fungus in its teeth. My mother had a terrible snake phobia, deep fear of snakes. But one of my favorite memories is holding that snake in my lap and holding its mouth open and it would not bite me and her leaning forward and stretching her arm until I swear it left its socket with, pen with a penicillin capsule and putting penicillin around the snake's teeth. Now, it wouldn't have worked because it's a fungus, it's not a bacteria, but she was doing her best. And um, she loved animals, she did not love snakes, but she did that. And, um, I was always moved by that. So I thought about that as I went around this show and all these people with their peculiar, both wonderful and sometimes disturbing relationships with other animals. The other uh, story I wanna tell is, you know, dogs are in captivity. Uh, dogs long ago were de domesticated and they were wild ones. They were all descended from gray wolves. And there's two theories about, um, Gray was, and before I say that, I'll say I had a dog when I was a kid named Banner. It's a collie. I spent much of my boyhood in the woods with the Banner, and I tell this story in there as he did extraordinary things. I never laughed at Lassie, you know. Timmy's in the in the well. Come quick, you know. I never that my dog did things like that. And yes, I may have glamorized him in my mind a little bit, but he did pull me out of a creek. But I went through the ice. I was up to my waist in, in cold water. I couldn't get out. He did things like that. Um, I always had the sense that Banner taught me a set of ethics. And I'd written about that before. And I asked a, a behavioral, a, a, an animal behavioralist about that. And he immediately dismissed me and said, no, 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 you're just anthropomorphizing. You're you're glamorizing your pet. But I still had that sense that at a time when I needed it as a kid, I watched Banner. I watched how he treated animals smaller than he, he was. I watched how he would protect people and how he would protect me. Um, there are two theories about how gray wolves were turned into, into dogs. One is that we domesticated them. We threw them the bones beyond the fire and they came closer over time. The other theory, and I actually think both of these theories are probably both true. The other theory is that they domesticated us, that we followed packs of wolves as they followed the herd. We watched how they hunted. We watched how they cooperated and acted as a team. We learned from that perhaps. In fact, we ate their leftovers as we followed them and we learned. Both of those things are true. Uh, I, when I was researching this, I found some German scientists who had done research on this and had decided that they did more to domesticate us than vice versa. And they actually in their papers used the word ethics, that we may have learned some ethics from these wolves, they're great family people. Uh, people, they're great family animals when you watch them. So I felt very vindicated when I found, found that, uh, that research. And I think Banner did teach me ethics. Long ago, Banner was wild, but, oh, but his sense of ethics had translated and had, had traveled through 30,000 years to me when I was eight or nine years old. And I think that we feel that with our animals. 
It's one of the reasons why I don't make a huge separation between domesticated animals and wild animals in the book. I think we need to see them in the same light. In many ways, dogs are a bridge to the wild, particularly for kids. Yes, certainly. Um, yeah, you touched on how uh, we need to recognize that originally these pets were wild, um, but I kind of want to twist it the other way. And uh, you talked a bit about having turtles when you, you were young and collecting them from your yard. And um, I mean, kids still do that now, but that's also something that here at Shavers Creek and other nature centers, we tend to discourage taking those animals from the wild. So I just wanted to hear your opinion and viewpoint on um, how we can teach kids to love nature, but how we can also discourage um, those kinds of behaviors or uh, encourage them to love the animal enough to leave them in their natural habitat. How can we kind of um, play with that balance? I, I need to make clear that I didn't collect those turtles when I was a kid in the yard. The story of the turtles is that every spring outside of Kansas City, uh, there would be a turtle migration of, bi bi uh, of, uh, of box turtles. And when the roads were wet, certain times during the spring, you'd see these turtles crossing the road. And you see a lot of them squashed and hit and all of that. And people did these cruel things like put the turtles upside down on top of fence posts when they were alive. And it's awful stuff. My parents would take me and my brother in the car the old Dodge out on those country roads when it had just rained and find those turtles. My mother would leap out of the car and run up and get the turtle that was going to be hit, she thought, and put it in the, in, the, in the well in front of my feet. And we would take those home. My father would build a turtle pit in the backyard. I would feed them all summer, grasshoppers and berries and all that, to get to know them. And then in, as winter approached, I would take them out and let them go uh, in, in, in the woods uh, or in the field behind our house. Now that's not, maybe not the way to do it, but that was, that was the way we did it. We thought we were doing a, a big favor. Um, I think this habitat of the heart and the, 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 um, the type of anthropomorphism that I was uh, talking about uh, is one way to do that, is to go out and see these animals uh, in their own habitat, in their own homes, and stay distant from them and don't interrupt their lives. But binoculars are good. You know? Sitting and watching them for a long time, having a sit spot where you take kids out and they sit very still and they wait for the frogs to come back up in the pond. And instead of taking the frog home, they become the frog. You know, you teach them how to have that sense of empathy so they have a deeper understanding of what it means to be a frog. In many ways, that's far more interesting than bringing the frog home and putting it in a terrarium or in our aquarium. So I think these, these, these ways of connecting, and just to tell you a story, I visited a nature center and I read about this in the book um, a couple of years ago, it was a wonderful nature center wolves come through this nature center. So it's up in the Northern states. And there's this wonderful uh, nature educator there, a young woman had a kind of ranger uniform on. And I was talking to her about it. She said the thing at that nature center that is most popular is the pond. It has a lot of frogs in it and people go down to families and the kids go down to it. And she says she takes kids down there. Now she's teaching science to meet the requirements of the state standards on science. So she takes the kids down to the, to the uh, pond. And I said, um, do you ever go down to the pond and just sit there and wait till the frog come back up and do that thing I just described? And she, she said, well, we, we do science exper experiments. We test the water. Da, 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 da. I said, no, no, I mean, do you ever go down and just feel what it is to be a frog, sit with the kids and parents. Uh, no, but we do a lot of these science experiments. And I asked her three times. And she, you know, the guy standing next to me said later, you know, she really couldn't hear you, that question. And the reason is she's under so much pressure 
to meet state standards. So you got some legislators in the state capital who are determining how we connect with animals. And um, so both things are necessary. The science is necessary, but somehow we've got to bring that, that connection. And I think uh, there are ways to do this that leaves the animals in, their, in the wild that does not disturb them to the degree that we cannot disturb, and we are always gonna disturb them. But we should be very careful about that. And the payoff is that it's far more interesting to um, become the snake in the wild than it is to take the, the, the wild out of the snake. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that there's a fine balance between, uh, I mean, of course, we want to interact and support and protect the animals that we're uh, seeing out in the wild. And that sounds like that's what you were doing as a child with those turtles, getting them off the road. Uh, but us as educators and authors and people that are, are promoting this uh, outdoor experience, uh, it's definitely on us to kind of lead children in the right direction and having them. I love that story about the uh, frogs going and sitting by the pond and just letting them come back up and let the children become the frog because those are the kinds of experiences that I, uh, I love when I'm with my groups of kids of just taking those little moments and things that they don't normally do. So I really appreciate that. Uh, I want to go back to a topic that we were talking on a little bit earlier. We had a question come in that said, um, how could I bridge the idea of a city being a new part of nature to someone who might not have as much experience or accessibility to places outside the city? And you mentioned, um, maybe you could tie back in, you said that cities can be an engine of biodiversity. So maybe you can tie that idea back in as well. Um, sure. The, um, well, first up, uh, something very curious is happening right now. And we've seen lots of stories about wild animals showing up into cities as we've pulled back into our houses. I mean, amazing stories, and some of them are true, because <laughs> some of them that, that have gotten a lot of traction are, are the images, actually the picture was taken years ago. Um, but some of this is true. They really are showing up. There's curi curious things happening. People are reporting that, um, that birds have become louder in their neighborhoods as we pull back into our houses. Apparently, the truth is, no, the birds have not become louder. In fact, the birds have become quieter because they had to be louder around us because we make so much noise. And once we were a little quieter, their decibels went down. They reverted to, to their normal uh, um, uh, loudness. Um, but what, what our perception is, because we're finally hearing them, because we're, we've shut up ourselves a little bit, our perception is that they're louder. <laughs> um, some of those animals that are showing up were there all along. One of the things that happens when wild animals uh, come into cities, and this has been happening for decades, more and more of this is happening, or we're creating neighborhoods in their territory and they're, they're still there. But um, more and more of them are, are coming in and they're often called neophilic, that's that word I can remember. It's the animals that are attracted to the new are the ones that are likely to migrate into cities. Um, and um, that's crows, coyotes, foxes to a degree, um, uh, uh, cougars, although I'm not sure about their curiosity, but uh, bears certainly are starting to come in. They're, they're, they're a neophilic animal. Um, uh, some of those animals that have showed up were there because one of the things that animals do, wild animals, when they come into a city, they change their patterns. They become uh, more reticent. Uh, Many uh, animals that are day diurnal that make their living during the day and come out and do things very become nocturnal when they move into a city. It's an unnatural state for them. But so we get into a situation like we're in now and animals start showing up. It's not because they just arrived, many of them. It's because they were there all along. We just hadn't seen them because they were had become nocturnal. Um, 
In terms of cities as engines of biodiversity, again, this is one of the lessons of the pandemic, which is you now have uh, a lot of urban designers who are talking much more seriously about, look, if we're gonna have more of these we, pandemics, we've noticed how people really need nature and that this is a healing thing. You know, newsflash for some of us, but they're noticing this, that people really want the natural world around them. It calms them down. It does all kinds of good things for them. And what happens when you don't have any nature around? A lot of neighborhoods don't have any nature except birds uh, and, and trees now and then. So part of the idea is to prepare for, for this reality by uh, increasing the amount of uh, nearby nature so people can have some nature. Also increasing biodiversity in cities because that in some cases is an antidote to zoonotic diseases. Um, uh, but there have been people thinking about this for a long time. Biophilic architecture, biophilic urban design is something I've written about in the past. And it's fascinating when you do, when you create uh, workplaces uh, using biophilic design that uh, uh, incorporates nature in around the building and into the workplace, sometimes symbolically, sometimes by having lots of plants or an atrium in the middle, those kinds of things. Uh, when you do that, uh, productivity goes up, turnover gets better, pr uh, creativity increases in those kind of workplaces. Uh, people don't use as much sick time. So uh, uh, bringing more nature into our lives where we work or go to school improves things. What if whole cities could be like that? What if whole cities could be designed biophilically? Um, and not only for our species, but for other species too. The animals are gonna be there unless we start exterminating them and they're still gonna be there. So uh, creating wildlife corridors through cities, which has caught on in some cities places where the animals naturally go through. This is particularly important if you've got predators in the city. Create places where they, they migrate, where they go underneath you know, the, the freeway through a wildlife tunnel, wildlife bridges, um, uh, but also changing our yards. Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, there's another name I'm blanking on who wrote uh, Bringing Nature Home. He's got another book out now. I'll think of his name in just a second. He's a friend and he's a good guy. Um, but he's talked about, um, Doug Ptolemy has talked about for years, and I've promoted this idea and promoted him sometimes more than he does because he's shy. Um, and I think he's done great work and it's a great idea. What if we changed our yards into native species? And it wasn't just our yard like my wife and I did in which we saw all kinds of new species showing up or we'd never seen before. Who knew there were native California butterflies? I didn't know that until they started showing up when we planted native species, plant species to our specific to our bioregion. What if it wasn't just our yard? What was the next yard, next one, next one? Pretty soon you'd have wildlife corridors threading through a city on private land and you don't have to wait for government to do it. The minute you have those native species uh, that were developed through uh, biology over millennia and longer, um, you start to attract or give uh, a chance for the insects that are native to that uh, bioregion and the birds and other animals to follow to come back to start to procreate more. And you've established, you've saved the food chain for who knows how many animals. It's one of the reasons why it's important, particularly if you're using native species to, to do butterfly, uh, to plant uh, the, the plants, the native plants in particular, that uh, are, are used for pollination by butterflies. We can bring back butterfly migration routes. We can bring back bird migration routes. We can change our cities. And in the changing of those cities to create better habitat for our fellow species, we create better habitat for ourselves in terms of our health and our well being and the reduction of our loneliness.
Yeah. And I think a big part of that too, is just, um, an awareness. I think that it's, uh, easy for people to plant things that are popular, things that are pretty in their yards and don't really know the impact of planting those native species. So, uh, recently I've been seeing a lot more movement towards that trend, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, I know that I certainly have, and I hear that you have in your yard as well. So hopefully together we can inspire our neighbors to do the same thing. Yeah, and again, this isn't an area where you have to be purists either. It can be, you know, have the roses in the middle of the yard and have some native species at the edges of the yard. Oh, certainly. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, so going in a slightly different direction, we have a question coming in that says, often it seems that connecting to nature means disconnecting to technology. Do you think that there are ways to help more people connect to the natural world and grow deeper connections through the use of technology? And how can we make authentic virtual nature experiences? Those questions kind of go hand in hand. Um, yeah, and th this is, I mean, we're doing it right now, aren't we? You know? Yes, we are. Um, uh, so, um, you know, it's not either. Um, there's a kind of a bump, bumper st sticker slogan that I that I wrote for the second of these books, the Nature Principle, which is a kind of equation that I think we can use. Which is, the more high tech our lives become, the more nature we need. It's a budgeting issue of money and time. The more high tech our lives become, and they will become more high tech, whether we like it or not the more nature we need as an antidote. And the studies show of the, the way we pay attention and things like that, psychological studies say that some of the burnout we feel from spending too much time looking at screens, um, uh, it's a neurological burnout. And the best way to uh, recuperate from that burnout is by paying a different kind of attention, which according to researchers named the Kaplan's, uh, happens easiest and fastest in natural setting. So if you go outside, if you connect with nature for just a little while, your brain recovers from the burnout it feels from too much technology. So we have to think of our environments, our schools that way. Yes, there's going to be computers in schools, but we've got to have natural play spaces. You know, we have to have ability for kids to go outside to learn in natural learning areas where there's plenty of research that shows that the grades go up. You know, in Massachusetts, I think there's 600, 800, I can't remember, number of schools were studied a few years ago. They looked at the schools that had greened themselves and the schools that had not. And by green, I don't mean solar panels. I mean, they'd actually uh, plant, had natural play spaces, natural learning areas. Um, uh, schools that had greened themselves, standardized test scores went up significantly. It's not either or. I mean, we can do both. Now, in terms of taking gizmos out into the, into the woods, I, I love digital cameras. I take a lot of pictures. I have some trail cams right on my property here. And I said, we moved to the mountains. We have about an acre. And I've got these trail cams out there. And I, I bring the chips in every now and then I look and I see these deer and I see wild turkeys and and a coyote came through and and a, and a, and a, and a possum that looked like a basketball I think was pregnant it was rolling up the hill and uh, uh, and one day they I brought the chip in and I, my wife was over at her computer I put it in the computer and she claims that I screamed <laughs> I didn't scream. Um, I probably made a loud noise because it was a mountain lion in our yard and I, you know, it was at night and it was at night. So that's technology and that's bringing us, I think, closer to animals just to know what's around us when we're not around. Um, I, I think there's lots of ways that one of the techniques, and I talk about this in vitamin N, there's a whole section on this question in vitamin N. One of the things that's suggested is that when we go on hikes with our families, for instance, I think a digital camera is a great thing to bring along, but not if you get too far into that digital camera. But one of the su suggestions is to bracket in, f in photography, and this isn't about photography, what I'm gonna say, that's you do a lot of shots on each side of the, you know, you bracket up and down in terms of the F-stops. But what bracketing means in this 
is that uh, parents can say to their kids, "Go hog wild with your t with your with your um, iPhone and your iPads on the way to the tr uh, to the hike," uh, but then please leave your gadgets in the in the car. In fact, look up the reptiles that you may see on the hike and uh, all that. But leave the gadget in the in the car, and when you get back to the car, you know, free range digital free range again. You can use them again. So it's not denying what the kids want, but it is giving them a chance to be disconnected enough uh, from technology that they actually do start to hear uh, the, the music of the wild. If they take the plugs out of their ears, they hear a different kind of music. Yes, I think there's definitely a way to kind of uh, tie those two worlds together. Like you said, I mean, technology is going to continue to advance. So I think there are ways that we can definitely take advantage of that and help people connect to nature deeper using those technologies. Um, just for sake of time, I think we have time for one more question. And people are curious about what is your next topic, project, or book that you will be working on? Uh, it's about recuperation. <laughs> It's fitting. Um, yeah, I can't help it. I think of new book ideas all the time. It's kind of mm -hmm. genetic, but this one is the hardest book I've done. It took four years. And um, uh, so it's, uh, I'm, I am thinking about new topics, but don't want to talk about them because I want to do them more. And right now, I think it's best that I, I pull back a little bit, but I am still writing. Um, op-eds and, 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 and I'm still working with the Children Nature Network. I'm the chairman, chairman emeritus of it. And I'm still, uh, um, to the degree I can, uh, championing the great people out there like you uh, who are uh, connecting kids and families to nature and doing that hard work. And right now, I'm, I'm worried about you. I'm worried about these programs because even the irony is that even as we become, we realize that people really need nature and they're realizing that more than ever, we don't have to convince anybody anymore. It used to be hard to convince them that they needed nature for their health. Now it's everywhere. All the media is covering it big time. Even as that happens and builds up pressure, builds up, you know, we've pulled back and the more we pulled back, the more we're hungry for nature connection. What happens when the pandemic, we hope, begins to lift. People head back to their cubicles, head back to their schools. I think a couple of things are gonna happen. I think that the, um, uh, the, the trauma being felt now will be followed by a different kind of trauma of re-entry. It's the culture shock you feel when you've been in a, um, a less developed, quote unquote, less developed country, and you come back to the United States, you feel this dissonance. Um, I was asked to give uh, to speak in Newtown, Massachusetts, uh, Newtown, uh, Connecticut, I think, uh, not long after the shootings, the killings at, at Sandy Hook, the kids in the school. And I, I asked them, why did you ask me to come back? And I spoke at the little New England type town hall and also at a nature center. I said, why did you ask me to do this? And they said, because, um, uh, because we know that nature helps people heal and we want to talk about that. And I said, why three months afterwards? And they said, because the psychologists tell us that after a major trauma, there's a secondary trauma among the survivors that hits about three months later, you know, when all the TV cameras have left and you're on your own again. Um, I think that we're gonna have a, a, a trauma, a follow-up trauma later. And there's gonna be a lot of dissonance and confusion. So the irony is that even as we learn more about how much we need nature now, and it's opening up all kinds of conversations that some of us have been talking about. I know you have for a long time. Will programs like yours, and I think yours will because you're associated with a university, 
Um, but there are a lot of programs out there that take kids into nature and families, particularly kids that are not going to have any much experience in certainly in wilderness unless somebody takes them. Uh, what happens to those programs, their funding between now and a few months from now or a year from now? We've really got to, I hope your people listening, you know, find a program to help get through this time because they're going to be more important than ever. Yes, certainly. Uh, I mean, we not we need nature now more than ever. And um, I agree, it is a little worrisome to think of those smaller programs um, that might go away in a time that they're needed the most. Um, so yeah, like you said, if you're listening and are able to support one of those smaller organizations or smaller programs, please do so because we need those programs. And that's how we're going to get those connections to nature that uh, we need to build those habitats of the hearts that we've talked about all day. So um, just to wrap up a little bit, um, I, I would like to say that if you would like to read Our Wild Calling or any of Richard's other books, you can order them from our partner, Webster's, Webster's Bookstore and Cafe, which is an independent bookstore here in State College, Pennsylvania. Um, I got my copy from their online store and I've already started reading it. Um, it is truly a remarkable book and I can't wait to uh, finish it. There's some really great stuff in there uh, and we've touched on all of it today. So. I hope that you all get a chance to read it. But before I wrap up, uh, do you have any parting words, Richard? Yeah, let me let me read a paragraph near the end of the book that I, it took me writing a whole book to come to this. It may seem oversimple, oversimplified, but uh, you know, I was thinking about the, the ethics that we bring to our relationship with nature and we're, you know, Wendell Berry talks about the, ex the ethic of exploitation, which is self-evident. And then there's the, eth the ethics of nurture, the ethic of nurturing uh, nature. And I think that those are extraordinarily important. We need to do more of the nature and nurturing, but in our relationship with animals, perhaps particularly, we need to refine that a little bit, I think, to remember it's not just about us and our needs whether it's a beautiful view or whether it's the health that an animal or a tree conveys to us, that, that gift. So I, 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 I describe this as, um, let me re read this graph. Our times call for the adoption of a basic principle that embraces both survival and joy as we repair our relationship with the natural world. We might call this the reciprocity principle. For every moment of healing that humans receive from another creature, humans will provide an equal moment of healing for that animal and its kin. For every acre of wild habitat we take, we will preserve or create at least another acre for wildness. For every dollar we spend on classroom technology, we will spend at least another dollar creating chances for children to connect deeply with another animal, plant, or person. For every day of loneliness we endure, we'll spend a day in communion with the life around us until the loneliness passes away. Wow. Well, I really hope that the people watching take those powerful words with them today because, yeah, we need to remember that we're all in this together, not just as community members uh, with each other, with other humans, but also the animals that we share this planet with. So uh, yeah, having that love for them and reciprocating the love that they're giving to us as well is very important. So I'd like to say again, thank you so much for coming today. Thanks, and uh, thanks Olivia yeah. and your colleagues yeah. for the great work that you continue to do. And, uh, and there are a lot of people and I hope they're yeah. listening that are uh, doing similar work and um, you know, this is at a, at a very deep level, I, and with the broadest definition of sacred, this is sacred work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for saying that. Yeah, I'm sure that there are uh, many of my colleagues on here as well, and um, they've been talking about this uh, this event for a while because, I mean, your work inspires us as well and inspires us to keep doing what we're doing. So um, we're all in this together, like I said before. So thank you. Um, 
Yeah, so if you enjoyed today's event and would like to keep up with programs and events that we offer at Shavers Creek, visit our website, shaverscreek.org, and follow us on our social media at Shavers Creek. Uh, there will be more Human Nature Series events uh, this summer, so keep an eye out for those. Uh, thank you all for tuning in today. I hope that you were able to take away a bit of inspiration to connect with the earth for the sake of our health, the animal's health, and the health of our planet. Again, thank you, Richard, for coming today. Uh, talking with you has been nothing short of inspirational, and I hope that all, our, all of our viewers felt the same way. Thanks, Olivia. All right, everyone, thank you for joining, and hopefully we'll see you next time. <laughs>